Welcome to TDCAT Tech. Today I'm looking at this. This is a, a REI CPE028. It's a wireless bridge. Effectively, the idea being that you transmit your signals across from one point, one of these, to the other one of these, rather than, say, running an Ethernet cable or something like that, allows you to cover a distance of, well, on the box, possibly up to something like three kilometres. But in reality, you know, you'd be looking at maybe a couple of hundred metres line of sight. This has a uh, an antenna gain of 14 dBi. It uh, uses, well, I'm... I'm I'm not absolutely certain of the antenna that's in this. I'm, I'll probably take it apart in a future video, but uh, I'm guessing a patch antenna or a sector antenna, probably a sector antenna in this, to uh, create a uh, fairly directional antenna, which can then be picked up by the other other end, which in turn will have the same type of antenna. And th that means that, yes, it's going to be fairly directional or very directional, in, in certainly on the uh, horizontal axis, and uh, also have... Um, pretty good noise rejection to other stuff in the vicinity as well, which means that your noise floor is going to be nice and low, nice and clean, which means that even at low signals, this thing will probably work okay. It's 300 megabits per second on the Wi-Fi side of things, but the LAN ports on this are restricted to 100 megabits per second. I'm not absolutely sure why they've done that, but it it is what it is, and I'm su I suppose it means that You'll always get a reliable 100 megabits per second. I've tested this, and effectively, the speeds I've got out, got out of this across a short distance are about 80 to 90 megabits per second, so perfectly respectable for any kind of 4K camera link or multiple 4K cameras. Certainly many, many HD CCTV cameras, which is the sort of thing this is designed for. In the box, we get two Ethernet cables to to uh, use with this. We also get two power over Ethernet adapters because this is not designed to be used on a 20 volt adapter, uh, sorry, 25 volt adapter, though you can plug power into it if you wish. Uh, it's designed to be used using power over Ethernet. Unfortunately, the adapters I got are uh, American plugs, so I can't use them, which is why I've got this in the bottom. I'm just using this, sort of using a... Uh, found an adapter it's actually running on 20 volts at the moment but it works okay i've got my other one powered up on 15 volts and it works okay so not an ideal scenario but it's all i can work with at the moment i've kind of just thrown it onto a light stand here i've kind of fashioned this just use one of the um, clips to put this on a light stand and um i i'm going to give this an initial review and say that the build quality of this is pretty poor right this this plastic is brittle the little clip that goes on the, the bottom here this this on on the other one has already broken it's already snapped off uh the ethernet cables are awful quality seriously i mean i'll show you on some b-roll now just how without any use whatsoever the ends have split and the uh the outer insulation has come off those ethernet cables already so this is not top quality as far as build goes it's 100 quid, and 100 quid for this type of setup is cheap, right? You'd probably be paying in excess of 800 plus for these type of devices if you were to buy something, you know, more substantial. But it's got a plastic case that comes over the top, water drainage. It doesn't have to be watertight because water drainage is all going to be downwards because you're going to have it fixed like this, probably pointing slightly downwards. So this is watertight. You can have it outside, and... It's a cheap way of getting some kind of wireless bridge going between two locations that simply cannot be connected with cables. Clearly there are two of these in the box. One is your access point, uh, which this one isn't actually. Uh, the access point would be the one you'd then connect to your kind of uh, your, your router or your, uh, your gateway. Um, and the other one is just your client side. So I guess the Wi-Fi equivalent would be your computer versus your router itself, you know, your actual access point. And um, the two will happily just connect to each other and then bridge the two networks. Uh, so you can then connect devices on the other end. So of course this, you know, this being the, the kind of client, if you like, this can then be connected via ethernet to a switch or just to a single device, or or whatever you need to do. It's just a way of bridging that gap, effectively. I mean, obviously, I'm using bridge in the sort of two terms, two ways here, but it is really that way of just getting devices connected across 
a space that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. If you look at the lights on the side here, they are not great. I mean, the separation of the light between... The, you, you really can't tell. Like, they come on, and obviously, because this one's lit, it just shines the light right through to all these other bits here. It really doesn't work terribly well. Uh, but you, you get used to it, and you can tell what's going on after a while. The networks that these are initially set up on are very unlikely to be on the same subnet. It's going to, very unlikely to be the same subnet or same network as your internet and the rest of your home internal network. So what I would recommend doing with these to start with is getting your access point, powering it up and connecting it directly to you uh, to a computer via an ethernet cable, setting that computer to the same subnet as one of these, changing that to whatever your home setup would be and going from there. So I'm just jumping into this during the uh, edit of this video because I just wanted to explain that a little more clearly. Really, if you're using these devices, it's very likely that your home network has an address range of, as an example, 192.168.0.1 up to 192.168.0.254. The subnet of that would be 255, 255, 2550. It's probably the case that your router, your main kind of device that sits and is on all the time, has the address 192.168.0.1 or 192.168.0.254. And that router, the DHCP side of that router, that's the server bit that gives out all the addresses to the rest of the things that connect, your phone, your laptops, whatever uses an address between those numbers. So your laptop might get 192.168.0.120 or something like that. Now the problem with these devices is that they are set to 192.168.201.17 and because of that 201 there that's a completely different network. They cannot see each other. So if you connect a device that's on that subnet, on that network, it cannot talk to a device that's on your network. So as a result, I found the best way to deal with them initially was to connect up my laptop directly to it, set my laptop manually to the same subnet as these devices, so that 192.168.20 whatever addresses, group of addresses, and then they can talk to each other. And only then you can change the addresses and the subnet in the devices to allow them to be the same as your home network. So then everything can talk to each other exactly as you want it to. Otherwise, you've got these two devices that are on a completely separate network. And that may be something you want sometimes, don't rule that out entirely. But other than that, don't expect them to be, don't expect to be able to see them on your network when you first connect them up. I think a lot of the comments online about these have been people saying, well, without some knowledge of networking, you're going to be pretty stuck. And yeah, I'd agree. Without knowledge of networking, this is a wireless bridge. It, it does need a bit of knowledge to get this set up. It's not one of these, plug it in, everything's going to work perfectly, happy. It's going to take you through a wizard and you know, you're going to have no problem setting it up. It's not like that. It's not, it's not that type of device. The interface is old looking clunky kind of very 90s in style 1990s 2000s design it just looks like a really old router and uh, it's not ideal but um but it works you know you make the changes and it does what it's supposed to do so once it's set up it just happily sits there and transmits the data which is what you want it to do you can see here now in this slightly botchy video here that I'm doing, apologies for that. But uh, you can see that these four lights are now lit permanently. And that reason is because I've just turned the access point on. So this is receiving that and the two are now connected together. There is theoretically data being sent between them. It, this isn't even facing the direction of the other one at the moment. And yet we've still got four lights on here, but it's only one room away. One room that doesn't let Wi-Fi signal through at all, but it's still doing okay, trust me. And I'll show you that in a second. So let me just spin that around so it's actually facing the direction of the other one. What we're looking at here is two access points. One is my standard access point in the living room. And the other one is, sorry, and this is my standard one in the living room, the uh, magenta colored one here. 
and this is the signal level of the bridge. So this is the other device and you can see that because these two are on different channels from each other. You've got one up, up here with a narrow bandwidth. I've set, set this to 20 megahertz bandwidth. Uh, you can set it to 40 if you want. I've got this set to 20 at the moment, just uh, so, you know, so as not to swamp the band and also just for reliability. And this one is much, much bigger bandwidth, as you can see, but much lower. However, the, the most important thing to point out here is the difference in signal between these two. So you've got, well, it, it is varying a little bit, admittedly, but you've got sort of more like a kind of between sort of 8 and 10 dB difference in signal between these two. So the fact that the bridge is just getting to here at 10 dB more, 10 dB is, is quite a significant amount, and yet it's managing to get make that trip through to here at a considerably better signal, so it's still left the kind of minus, what, what is the signal it should tell me on here, actually. Um, should tell me the signal just up here for this one. It's just, I've got it on channel 149, and it's a signal of minus 59, whereas my main is minus 69. So yeah, exactly 10 dB difference between the two. Now, as you can see, yeah, I'm using channel 149, but I must point out that in the UK, at least, I think for outdoor site to site like this, you would need a license to use that frequency. So these channels can't be used in the UK. Um, you'll, so check if you're going to buy one of these, check the area where you live to see whether or not you need a license from the uh, local kind of regulations. Uh, or like local sort of or local I say local national kind of authority the off you know equivalent of UK Ofcom or something because it's quite likely that for an outdoor Wi-Fi type setup like this so site to site access point you will need a license but yeah we can see here along the bottom here that we're maintaining a pretty good gap between these two so this is your regular home Wi-Fi and this is the benefit of using the bridge. Now, one thing I know you would all love to see is me test this across a bigger distance. So try 100 meters, try 200 meters, 500 meters. I, I honestly just can't do that at this time. I have no way of setting that up. If anyone wants to take these off my hands and give that a go, by all means, you're welcome to do so. But I cannot test that, I'm afraid, uh, at this time. But I can show you the web interface of these devices. So should we take a look at that? Yeah, let's go in. Let's have a look at the web interface. Well, I thought I'd give one of their Ethernet cables a go. I have uh, hooked up my laptop just using this LAN cable. I've turned it off Wi-Fi as well. And this is going directly into here, the um, <clears throat> Ethernet port on the uh, wireless bridge. So that's my only connectivity now to the net. And the question is, does it work? Well, let's do a speed test on fast.com. Well, I've definitely got connectivity. 60 megabits per second, 62, 63. Not too bad. And remember, I'm only using 20 megahertz of bandwidth, so let's get into the uh, interface and change that, put it up to 40, see if it improves the speed at all. Now, remember, I set up both the access point and the client to be on the same subnet as my home network. So I should be able to get to this from 192.168.1.2.1. Nine. That's the address of the access point, so not the one that's in the room here with me. And there we go. We have our web interface. Wow, this looks like something from 1995. And I think, what did I set it to? It's pretty slow to log in. But there we go. We have access. And remember, I'm accessing the access point here. So this is the bit that will have the settings on around the SSID and what that's set to because the other bit has to match that. So here we go. I can set the name of my SSID here. I can set my security type. Um, I can set my 
IP addresses and, and here we go down the bottom here. I've got my region set to United States. That's basically so I can use channel 149, um, which I get a higher output on. Uh, so yeah, shouldn't do that. But you know, as I said before, check out the legal aspects in your country. But I'm gonna change this to 40 megahertz. And I don't need to change anything on the on the other side because it should just automatically pick up the fact that the access point has changed the bandwidth it's using. So I'm just gonna save that. Then I'm gonna apply that change. Okay, so now, will the system come back to life? There we go. So we're now back online. Transmit rate is 300 megabits per second. I hope you can see this, by the way. I realize that the interface is absolutely tiny. And you get little sort of tra graph, graph, um, traffic stats at the bottom here and things. It's, uh, it's, fine. it's fine, you know, it does the job. So let's see whether that's made any difference. So remember, this is traffic directly across from my, uh, from my gateway, across the wireless connectivity, this wireless bridge straight into my MacBook here. Yep, I'd say that's an improvement. So we're now getting traffic into the internet, from the internet, through the gateway, um, so through the router, and the router goes into the access point of this this um, setup, this wireless bridge, across 5.8 gig on channel 149 at 40 megahertz bandwidth, and then directly from the LAN port of the client into my laptop at 90 megabits per second. And as I say, the most it can do due to a restriction on the LAN port is 100 megabits per second, so that's absolutely fine, decent. So this is the web interface of the client now. So for example, this one, you can see the signal strength of the device because this is the one that's picking up the access point. So this one, here you go, you've got, you've got a signal strength meter on here. And you can see that this device, so my laptop wasn't getting this signal strength, but why wasn't my laptop getting this signal strength? Well, it doesn't have an optimized antenna, does it? Because an optimized antenna and directional antenna works on the receive side as well. It benefits the receive side too, not just, you know, so you've got a good focused antenna focusing to a laptop, that's fine, but focused antenna to a focused antenna and you get even better. So we're now up at minus, so that's, this is through a wall that doesn't pick up a thing and we're up at minus 40 dB on here. And remember that my, in fact, I'm going to turn my Wi-Fi back on here because I want to see what it was on the um, the other the other device. So it is Living 5G. That's the one we're interested in, and we have a signal. So from the same location in the house, we have a signal of minus 71 dB. Minus 71 versus minus 40. I mean. That is a massive, massive difference. Anybody who knows about signal levels and uh, the dB, the decibel scale, will know what a vast difference that is in signal between minus 40 and minus 70. So there we are, a quick look at the REI CPE-028. I uh, hope that was helpful if you're looking at a product like this. This is a budget variant. It isn't something I would recommend for build quality. It isn't something I would recommend for the bits you get with it, but the actual main board inside seems okay. It seems pretty reliable. It certainly seems to do the job. It connects and it connects reliably. I've left it on for some days actually, and it's been absolutely fine. It's not the fastest, but it's perfectly reliable. And that's what you need with this type of setup. If you're gonna do a trip wirelessly across a bigger distance, even if it's only 50 meters or 100 meters, across the road to your friend's house a couple of streets away. It's got to be line of sight though. This is effectively a link transmitter and receiver. So you would expect to set that type of link, any kind of link up like that, would ex you'd expect it to be line of sight or at least assume line of sight is required. If you can't quite make it, you might do all right, but assume that line of sight is required between those two sector antennas and they should do a good job. Thanks for watching. I'll put links to this in the description. 
I think this was from Amazon US actually, uh, but I'll put uh, I'll put a link in there anyway, which will redirect to something similar in other countries if it's not available in your country. But uh, thanks for watching, and I will uh, see you soon.